actually the fourth we have had since last fall. And uh, our panelists include Michael Quint. And Michael should get all the credit to have edited the three hour uh, BBC documentary down to the digestible, that is within our time frame, uh, 45 minutes. And of course, nothing is digestible here. And Michael, please. And uh, the second, I'm just seeing the faces, so it's not in any particular order. Uh, Pat Comerford, who's a um, member of a PRISM, um, ac student activist. And we have our provost, Selassie Williams. And we have uh, Anne Bobrisky, uh, a member of TRIOTA, uh, which is a women's studies on the society, and a member of the women's studies graduate program. And then we have a uh, Professor Steve LaRocco uh, from English department. But Steve also um, is a uh, full-time faculty activist, um, has a very important title, president of AUP. Uh, uh, AUP stands for Association of American University Professors. And then Paul McKinsey, who's uh, one of our really important background people, Paul McKinsey from Public Affairs. So Paul, please, um, there we have uh, actually a few more chairs. Um, I would just, uh, you know, given the luxury of um, the size of a town meeting, we don't have the size of a town meeting, but we have a spirit and heart of town meeting, so I would really like to invite everyone uh, here to come sit closer. So consider this is actually, you know, a, uh, a round table of a sort. Um, Gosh, my whole body is trembling. Of course, nothing uh, we viewed was actually not known, except I had never learned about Shark Island, I have to say. That was something definitely new uh, to me. Um, and I'm just going to say something quickly. I would like to uh, invite all the panelists to make remarks. Um, Maybe let's try not to make it more than three uh, minutes, and then let's open up. And we also would like to see who is in the audience with us today. I don't know everyone um, uh, really here. Let's just say, um, oh gosh, I maybe just a few things. This is actually the second of the 64 days of nonviolence, and maybe. Um, of course, every day should be our observation of nonviolence. Um, but uh, at this university, in Women's Studies program, we try to use the spring um, semester as our opportunity to observe and uh, celebrate all cultures, heritages, and traditions. And and talking about you know this co courageous conversation of on white privilege is actually our opportunity to talk about the other side of white privilege, racism. And it is really what a crime against humanity. And it is history, as the BBC documentary subtitled, you know, a history, but it's a living history, it's our reality. And um, I just would like to, um, I don't know in what order we're going to do this, um, maybe um, left to right, right to left, I mean, my, my natural inclination is left, so uh, maybe we can Steve with that. <laughs> Start with <a> Steve. <laughs> Actually, there's something I'd like to say. Um, this video is based on three large sections uh, that was cut down and put into this. You may have noticed some things like cut across as you're watching it. And uh, a lot of us actually worked on editing, Gary and I, as well as Mike. Absolutely, yeah, Dan, Gary and um, Paul and Mike. And your brother, Dan. And, he, and probably we should give you the first credit. <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Oh, I, I said, okay. let's go from my left. Actually, okay. from this side will be my right. So okay. we go any direction. <laughs> I think I just have a kind of response, which is after seeing something which is so horrific that it's easy to kind of be repulsed by how awful racism can be without really kind of staying with the sense that they did at the end, that the institutional, economic, and social problems that are involved in race are 
mutable and convertible and keep doing that historically over time period so that what we end up with is, in a sense, white privilege taking almost like a chameleon different forms historically as it progresses forward and in some ways becoming less egregious and less awful um, but without sort of disappearing or without going away and still able to render enormous parts of the population at least to some extent socially dead if not literally dead there's a, a metaphor I'd like to pick up from Orlando Patterson um, an Afro-Caribbean scholar who wrote about slavery as being a form of social death and what he meant by that was people who were enslaved were unable to fully participate or participate at all in normal social life um, what gets controlled for those people is almost all their social interactions they can't marry on their own they often are unable to have children on their own without it being dictated by people who have control over them. And one of the things that happens culturally is there are still forms in which dominant cultures create forms of social death which are not nearly so um, explicit or egregious as occur in slavery, but which nonetheless render significant portions of the population, typically those that are non-dominant, as being in one way or another socially dead and with much more limited opportunities. And the sense that we go from situations in the kind of egregious colonial situations that were described in the movie of literal death to situations of what I would call now social death that were talked about at the end of the, um, the uh, um, film, I think are really worth keeping in the foreground and that the um, there's not much to say positive about moving from real death to social death um, until you can actually get rid of the kind of social deaths that I think are pervasive in this culture um, currently. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I'm Anne from Women's Studies. I had two points that I kind of wanted to bring up. Hopefully we can discuss a little bit. The first one is I think this um, film is extremely beneficial and it can educate but the one kind of critique that I have is the absence of a gender analysis. In that a lot of, and I've seen other parts of it where um, a woman's voice, whether it's a scholar or the experience of a black woman or an uh, indigenous woman or any woman um, is kind of absent. And I think that's something, I mean this is a panel on white privilege, but I think it should also be intersected with gender and you know white male privilege. I mean, I think a lot of minority women often are told to either pick gender or race, and it's not talked, um, you know, at intersections. So that's, and also the fact, not just the negative experiences that women, minority women, have um, endured historically and continue, but also their participation in resistance, uh, their leadership in rebellions with the Haitian um, slave rebellion in Nani and Jamaica, um, Harriet Tubman. I mean, just, I, I feel like we need to bring that voice into this discussion. Um, and then secondly, as a, as a graduate student hoping to become an educator and a professor someday, um, I know we kind of all talk about this multicultural stance, which I think is good, but in a sense with a lot of courses, not just on this campus, but throughout the country, um, multiculturalism in a semester long course can kind of be segmented into like a one week diversity week in each course, instead of, you know, putting um, kind of a multi-centered analysis into a course or into education where it's interwoven throughout the educational learning. It's not just kind of put as, okay, we're gonna talk about every ethnic group in one or two weeks and leave it at that. And I think as, because we're gonna talk about with University Connection, I think as educators, maybe some professors feel they don't have the knowledge to teach you know, other voices besides a white perspective into the curriculum. But I think it's important if you're an educator to re-educate yourself. Um, continue to learn and to kind of come out of that comfortability of kind of the stagnant status quo of education. I just think that's so important, not just in, you know, higher education, but certainly elementary, secondary education where 
Um, I think it's consistently a very European white perspective on throughout this, whether it's history, English, math, science, any subject needs to kind of have this multi-centered approach. Thank you. You know, I see a film like, like this one, and um, <clears throat> it evokes an emotion of anger, which makes it very difficult to be articulate and to say anything very thoughtful. I mean, this is the kind of thing that makes people run out in the street and start fires and burn down your own community or whatever community you can, you can reach uh, at the time. Um, I think the long history that was portrayed by this documentary really indicates how deeply rooted uh, racism is into the very social fabric of our, of our global society. It's not just an, an American experience, it's a global experience. And I think what some people, you know, wonder about is how can such, how can this kind of brutality be allowed to to continue on for so long. And I think it's important for all of us to understand the notion of institutionalized racism and how those racist values and, and precepts are inculcated and, and integrated into the very fabric of the institutions that we so highly value, including the university, and perhaps maybe most importantly, the university. You can see how scientists of the early 20th centuries and, and so forth were um, a fundamental tool in, in helping to carry out the genocide and destruction of people of color from all over the, all over the world. Um, you know, we look at society today, if we just look at the American uh, society, and we see that African Americans are doing so poor on the bottom of the, the economic level, they're if you look at health care statistics or, or uh, issues of infant mortality, for instance, you see that African Americans are on the bottom rung of almost any statistic you can look at, education um, and so forth. And you wonder, why is this the case? And there's, there's an impulse, I think, in American society and European societies or any society that's dominant dominantly European, that, um, you know, there's the, the genetic argument is still there. That there's a genetic inferiority in these individuals, so no matter what kinds of social programs you develop, no matter what kind of advantages you try to give to people of color, they're still going to come out on the bottom. Um, Claude Steele, a, a noted psychologist back in, back in 1976, I think it was, or no, it was actually later, 1981, conducted a study at the University of Washington in which he looked at the, the average GPA by ethnic group over a five-year period of time. And what he discovered was that in each semester and every year for each one of those five years, there was a complete stratification of uh, academic achievement by the students as measured by, by GPA, uh, with African Americans always on the bottom, um, I think uh, Latinos were, were second, European Americans were third, and Asians were, were on the top. Um, and, you know, while that should have been disturbing and should have taken that university to, to really take on a kind of a, a, a radical approach to education and completely redo or restructure the educational uh, process there, instead what happened was it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> They, you know, there's kind of that circular argument. Obviously, they don't perform because they're genetically inferior. So again, no matter what we do. So I guess I'm going to end my comments by saying that uh, there's a really important and critical role for universities to play. One reason, we produce the K-12 teachers that go back and teach the young uh, folks in our communities, um, but we are also the ones that shape the values and um, the understanding of the world among those who are going to become leaders in, in our society.
And so we have a fundamental role to look at what we do. The struggles of, of black folks during the 60s was to try to open up the doors to the university, not only for blacks and Hispanics and Asian and Pacific Island peoples to come into the university and have a seat there, but actually to begin to transform the curriculum so that the real story of uh, human history would be told. The real story of human history is not being told on this campus, and it's not being told on most campuses around the United States, even with the struggles that many of us went through back in the 60s to try to create black studies programs and Chicano studies and women's studies and, and gay and lesbian studies and so forth. The stories are not being told. You get a chapter here and a chapter there. It's a slice of life, uh, but the true story is not being told. So the challenge to us, for those of you who are really committed to, to combating the kind of destruction uh, that you've seen portrayed in the documentary here, is to begin looking at this institution or any other institution you're in and seeing how you can humanize that institution by getting it to tell full story and the complete story of human history. Thank you, Selassie, for that story of humanity. Um, this is my second time watching the documentary, the edited version, and the initial question I had the first time around was the same initial question I had the second time around, which was what happened to my education as I was going through uh, you know, how was I taught about Darwin and social Darwinism without uh, learning about the manipulation of social Darwinism um, for eugenics? And it's, it, it's an alarming question. So the question is, what do we do now? And how do we affect change on this campus and on universities uh, in, in general? And there, I had an amazing experience this morning of talking about this panel, and I know that some people have heard this, this story already, but uh, talking about what's going to happen here today, and a professor of mine took the opportunity to really discuss with the class whether or not white privilege, in fact, existed at all. And um, I, I use the word discuss loosely, though we did go around the room of, of about 12 people, and the uh, the outcome of that discussion, or, or, or venting of opinion, really, is what it was, was that white privilege does not, in fact, exist. We have transcended this, um, and it's not a viable uh, topic for discussion, essentially. And it was, you know, unsurprising, shocking, at the same time, and uh, um, Melissa Harris Lacewell, uses the analogy, who's a professor at Harvard who has dedicated her, her, uh, her time and work to creating open conversations about race on campus, as well as writing, writing books and doing uh, a talk circuit, talks about, you know, if Jim Crow was a nail and we used a hammer to, to effectively deal with that, to, to bang away at Jim Crow, we, you know, this new, structural and systematic colorblind racism is now a screw and we are still using a hammer to to deal with it and um and just the conversation going forth how what do we do here how do we affect change how do we open up the conversation not simply to what it means to be a person of color but more uh more adequate to answer another question, which, what does it mean to be white and, and for whiteness um, and white privilege? And, um, and there are classes that I know Toni Morrison teaches a class on whiteness, and these, these classes are popping up in women's studies departments, and perhaps we need to look to our women's studies department to explore that option, or, or, or you know, I, I don't know what the FYE experience is like. I've had professors talk to me about uh, about that experience and the um, their opinion of of the diversity training that goes on or exposure that goes on in FYE. But we we desperately need to reevaluate how we are we are handling this. For those of you not part of the Southern community, FYE's uh, first year experience actually just 
took off glass master, and I think Pat just made a very good point in terms of humanizing our education here at Southern, telling the full story that uh, whiteness, the white privilege, the discussion of uh, the hu full human story has, you know, has to be there in the piece. And my, I'm sorry, I try not to have insertion, but I cannot help. But he was sitting right next to a provost who, who was actually a major force behind FYE. Okay, um, I, I took a few things out of this film. We didn't get a chance to show the first episode. And the first episode deals with slavery, and one of the points that was brought up in the first episode is that racism uh, came after the slave trade had kicked into gear. And the lesson that you can gain out of that is, in my opinion, one of the premier lessons of the social sciences, which is the thought process of racism was, was used to rationalize and justify what was being done already. And a lot of students in talking to them, whenever I asked them that question, and in my opinion, you would think when somebody asks you that question that you might kind of be looking for the other answer. And they still say often that they think racism came first. And so you have this uh, irrational prejudice on behalf of these people who then lead you to go and do this. Uh, now, the, the, another uh, lesson that you can get out of that phenomenon is that the, the system of racism is a, a structural one. And in the, the first episode, they say that it's in large part economic, uh, which it is, and I don't want to place economics necessarily at the center of the picture. Um, but at the end of the film, just before the last clip of what we showed, they define institutionalized racism. And they say it's uh, where you have no overt policy saying anyone is discriminated against, but all the outcomes of your operations are overtly discriminatory. How do you get there? How does that happen? It's the culture of racism within an organization that overpowers a formal commitment to equality that produces the racist outcome. Now, in my opinion, uh, of all the things said in the film, that's where they miss the mark. And the reason they miss the mark is because it's not a, just a culture of racism. Uh, we're dealing with a current economic system which, uh, with, with market capitalism, which by its very nature concentrates wealth heavily in society. Now, if you're to look at the, the slave trade and, and think that uh, you could have killed racism uh, but keep the economic system of, of slavery there, uh, you, you'd have another thing coming. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that the racism was going to come into play because of the exploitation, which is the first point in the first film. Um, uh, from that, uh, just a couple more points. Um, uh, uh, and just as a stat, in case people don't know, the top 1% have 40% of the nation's wealth. The top 10% have, I believe, 60, top 20, 80. And uh, 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 no non-whites non -whites have less than 10 cents to the dollar of wealth, not income, of wealth in this country. So until we begin to address some of these issues, which goes to fundamental issues of economic democracy, which seems pie in the sky, uh, if we don't get rid of those, even if race is, is taken out, and this, this leads to another point, even if, if race begins to become uh, uh, wither away over the course of 400 years of the pace which we're on, something is gonna take its place. And you know they're talking at the end, I mean, one of the fields, if, if you start looking into it, is psychiatry, uh, which has its kind of physical, scientific categorization of people, and it, it could go in different directions. Um, the point of colonialism is obvious. I'll just be very brief. Um, the Iraq War is obvious. Uh, Martin Luther King was talking about Vietnam. I'm sure everybody knows that as you know, taking resources away. 
Um, so for at least for students, you can take a look at some of these things and you can see things that are going on in Iraq today, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as far as education goes, um, I, I want to be uh, positive because we have major issues in the educational system. And if we're going to sit here and think that we don't, uh, and I'm assuming everybody here understands this, um, uh, to address those, I think there are some structural things, but I, I don't want to go into that necessarily uh, because we're dealing with what we have. And, uh, but as far as education goes, I believe that student to student education is way more important than what goes on in the classroom. Because I personally don't have confidence in the classroom. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I don't, and, and I don't, it's everybody on the, on the left, so to speak, wants to talk about getting the right content in there. And like I said, you're dealing with the real world, but the fact of the matter is, is that the highest form of education which we have is things like tonight where it's a voluntary association mm -hmm. and I think we've been student to student to Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I consider myself, or, sorry, Paul McKenzie from Public Affairs. I do web work and graphics here. Um, I, I consider myself fairly conscious and I try to keep up with the issues and what's going on. But as I was going through this video and doing a lot of editing, I'm like, oh my god, I didn't know about this, I didn't know about that, and I'm going through and I'm like, how is it I'm supposedly a conscious person and I don't know half of the stuff in this video? You know, I, I research stuff all the time. How is it I didn't get this? Or no one told me, you know? So I think there are major issues with the educational system and we need to get this stuff in the curriculum, whether people like it or not. I mean, oh, there's U.S. history. Well, gee, I took U.S. history. I never saw that. I saw Dr. King, Malcolm X, and heard a little bit about civil rights or something like that. That's it. I don't know half the stuff on this video. And for me, that's very disturbing. And that absolutely has to change. I mean, I, I don't know what anyone else thinks about that, but I've never heard half the stuff on this video. So I'll just Yes, thank you um, to all our panelists. Actually, there are two more people that should have been sitting here but uh, got trapped by the weather, not having a right to come back to campus, including uh, Latasha La Blackwell, uh, president of BSU, and uh, Brian Dallas, member of BSU, as well as Olas. Um, so they send their regrets and um, Again, this goes to show uh, that this is another layer when we talk about uh, the, um, um, I guess, the economic dimension of, uh, of a society we live in. And I want to actually at this moment kind of have a chance to know who's who in the audience and then just open up because I think we have um, a lot to talk about. And many of us sitting here, you know, um, Colin Bennett applauded, but those of us who didn't applaud, we actually applauded in our different ways. In our minds, yes, right, right on. So we have much to actually say and talk to each other. You know, student to student education, FYE education, FYE program, and uh, humanizing our education here at Southern, telling the full story. But before we go, you know, let's see who's who. And would you please identify yourself and also the, uh, maybe the student organization you may represent, or the faculty or staff organization. Anyone? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I am Tiffany. I am Um, I, I guess I would say I'm a first semester sophomore, but. I'm Dan, I'm Mike's brother. I uh, actually teach high school at uh, Harding High School in Bridgeport. So 
But if anyone has questions about the school system, I'm right there. So. <laughs> Absolutely. You were quite right there. I, I mean, just maybe we should just go around. So I'm looking at you. I'm Tony. I don't go to school here. I'm friends with Dan and Mike. I just want to come and see what everyone has to say. My name's Arthur. I'm a junior here. Um, <laughs> majoring in history with certification to teach. Um, affiliated with College Democrats. Just to kind of go off what you were saying, there is a major problem with K through 12 social studies education. Um, my personal feeling is that there is not enough of a Frarian problem posing classroom kind of method going on. It's a lot more of that banking concept where teachers are are just seeing themselves as depositors and it's it's this vicious cycle that we really need to end. Um, my name is Peter McKenzie, I'm here with Dan and Paul. Actually, that's Paul's twin brother. Oh, my name is Levon. I'm a political science grad student here. Um, as many of you are, I was just telling the, the stuff that I didn't learn about the Namibia genocide in uh, India. I'm, I, I consider myself fairly uh, uh, involved uh, since I, I studied uh, the Jewish uh, the Holocaust. And I, I was just uh, uh, surprised that uh, I never, ever heard of the Nine Union Day and uh, certainly I was disappointed. I mean, I was, uh, if you guys remember last semester, I was uh, spearheading the, the educational system was uh, correct, but uh, I, I guess it made me question my own mind. I mean, if I didn't learn about this, then there are certain things that I just don't know about at all. And so it was a very disappointing. I'm Colin Bennett. <laughs> That's enough. Okay. Should probably take this and uh, turn to no, you. No, so. that's fine. Uh, I'm Gary. I work here for the AUP. Um, I'm involved in all of these, these things that we do. I'm also the chair of the Connecticut Federation of Black Democratic Clubs. So, for many reasons, this is of interest to me. Um, speaking of student to student education, I have to say to nine conversations, we call it courageous, but really it's a human conversation courageous on this campus because we haven't been courageous enough. I want to say that the conversation is really made possible because the students, it's student, uh, it has been student driven. The last semester on this campus we held three conversations and the second and third we had an incredible student turnout and all of those two conversations students say well we need to continue that's just put it together they actually we were determined I, I said it with them it was quite an honor to work with uh, this very diverse group of uh, student leaders staff and faculty 
um, to they they were determined to put this event as one of the very first um, of all the events in 64 days of nonviolence. And I would just like share with you one little anecdote. I just came back from the mid-year governing council of National Women's Studies Association. I'm an officer, I'm is the vice president of the association. And mid-year we meet you know, in the conference site. So we were in Cincinnati for a whole weekend. What weekend all the very intense engagement. In fact, the, uh, the whole governing council started with uh, a day-long workshop called, it's an anti-racist, anti-oppression workshop called Stop Dreaming, Keep Working. And the second day was a day-long so-called board orientation, but a lot of it still evolved around how do we do as feminists, as a feminist organization, to undo the oppression around us, first form of gender and racial oppression that we see so blatantly. I mean, of course, it goes on, all kinds of oppression. Um, so it was pretty intense, but really, really nothing hit me as hard as when I heard my sister of color walking around asking. Because we, we know in June we're going to return to Cincinnati for the uh, five-day conference. When my sister of color walking around asking, what do, pla uh, what do black people eat? I know we really have a serious issue here. Even in a city, well, I say even in a city. In a city like Cincinnati, people of color do not always walk comfortably. And we have to find out where we can eat. So I would just, uh, at this moment, I think we have uh, quite a few comments already from the audience. And uh, so the inter uh, you know, uh, comment. So why don't we? Uh, just open up to uh, your comments. Well, I, was, I was interested in Annette's description of her class, and I, my experience with women's studies, um, I was Trisha's teaching assistant for Women's Studies 100, and I mean, consciousness is raised in those classes. It can be raised, and, it, and that must be happening in the other studies as well. And how can we bring that to the whole to the whole campus? That opportunity for consciousness raising because it's such a, a beautiful, incredible, life changing thing, and I we, we need it to happen. And I, I'm just trying to figure that out. How can we do that as a university? I like that very spirit. The problem solving. We need to find solutions, and absolutely, that's why we need to this need to have this these conversations. I think you have to ask yourself the question, why have, not, why have you not heard about this history? Why have you not been taught this history from the earlier grades? Not here at the university. Why have you not heard about the, uh, you know, the concentration camps and, and, and the kind of lynching and so forth that, that's gone on in the, in the slave south and so forth in this country? Why have you not heard about that and, and really been told the full story? You have to ask, ask yourself that question. What's, what's the answer to that? I, uh, my son David is a sophomore in high school, and he's doing, in fact, I think maybe all three of them, they do it on three-year cycles, U.S. history. They're all doing U.S. history this year because they're three grades apart, I think. Um, and, you know, I look at his textbook with him frequently, and it, it's stunning to me how boring it is, how white male it is, how, you know, date-oriented it is, dates and wars and... Why is that? I mean, history can be, it can offer so much that applies to our lives now, and I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it at all. Who's making this decision and why it's still being taught that way? Um, two things I want to talk about. Uh, let's see. Uh, one, maybe somehow we could get this video maybe online on YouTube or uh, spread it through Facebook or something, and I think that could help raise consciousness. But I think, I, I do think, <laughs> it's actually on YouTube already. Oh, it is? Okay. Well, I'm, okay. <laughs> I, I was about to say, we should probably contact the BBC, get their permission before we do anything like that. Um, secondly, about the educational system, remember in part of the section it says that the Nazi program, a lot of it was funded by Rockefeller Foundation? Mm -hmm. 
right? And it's funny that I've heard about Rockefeller and some other areas about education. They actually helped to set up the current education system that we have. Um, if you read this guy, was it Tom Getty? I think. John, John Taylor got, what's the GA? Gatto. Gatto, sorry. He was Teacher of the Year in New York, and uh, after he got Teacher of the Year, he pretty much like just the whole school system and broke down the history and the creation of it. And Rockefeller and Morgan, J.P. Morgan, and a couple of the big banker types, rich people, actually helped to construct the current school system that we have, and it's based on segmenting the way people think, uh, cutting up their thought patterns so that they're more like soldiers or good workers, so you're being trained to be just a good worker, make your widgets, but not to be independent thinkers like a Benjamin Franklin. And it's funny that the same guy that helped to design our school system was also funding the Nazis. It's the same kind of system of controlling people um, and breaking up the thoughts. They had this thing where you break up the, 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 the lessons or into subjects, and then you had your bells for periods. You tell the people when to go here and there, and that stops the interdisciplinary learning and thought patterns, which will you know affect your brain. So now people are just more robot like, you know. So you can tell someone the science. I'm not robot like. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a lot of people, you know, and, and then um, our education we, system is really affected. We see a lot of things. hands here. So uh, Paul, you actually provoked response. So we, I, I saw actually uh, two minutes first, and then Dan and Peter. I was just going to quote that kind of reminded me, you kind of remind me of it. My friend found it online. I can't quote it exactly. I don't know who it's by or anything. But um, it said that school was, or was school was like, you know, established not to make musicians or poets or artists just organize the people. And I thought that was a really interesting quote. I learned, I heard it in high school. And, really got to me thinking like, oh, I went to school just because, you know, kids had nothing else to do, and it was kind of interesting. Um, just to also address that, I mean, there are a lot of, it's not just ignorance, I mean, there are a lot of people who are very smart and very organized and very mean who don't want this information yeah. taught. Right. Um, one of the people I work with happens to be the part of my program. If you were watching this conversation, you'd say we were the racists because we're paying attention to race. And that you're actually putting barriers in front of other people. And that by, oh, you're making people, you know, you're enabling them and you're making them weaker by telling them race matters and they should just ignore it and work hard. And, you know, I mean, and these people don't want this conversation out there. Actually, when you saw the video, that guy who, uh, we're without sanctuary trying to get those lynching pictures into the records. Those people know those pictures exist and they don't want them there. You know, people remove them from the other archives. I mean, there's a very strong interest in not having this stuff addressed. I see threads of, uh, of these comments and I would like to bring back, but Peter, mm -hmm. you, you're the next. Um, just brings me back to what you were saying about when you brought up the discussion in your class. Um, and then you said, why was I even taught this? And I think that ties into what Paul was saying. You were t everyone was taught about Darwinism in the in science class. So it's a separation with that in history. It's not tied in. You're not taught to think, oh, this connects with this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really separated. Yeah, it's that segmentation. Um, yeah. Meaning as though it doesn't somehow work cohesively yeah. together. If I could, I would say so Darwinism is not just taught in the science class. It is actually part of the ideology that builds a lot of, uh, you know, uh, areas of studies, disciplines of studies. So the this sort of a supremacy thinking, supremacy thinking, white supremacists above all, is built in there. So um, our job is really to unlearn a lot of this, this institu institutionalized racism, internalized racism. And there, I saw some other hands. Colin, did I say yours? Yes. I kind of hate to be that guy. Okay, you are. <laughs> yeah. All right. But really, what's the purpose of us, us all sitting here tonight to talk about this for two hours so we can just go home and feel good about ourselves? No, of course two? not. All right, so what's the point? What are we going to leave here and do? Are we just going to spread this? I mean, because we're here because we want to be. But I'm a very action-oriented person. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't see any change happening necessarily because of this, because I don't see any goals here. We don't have a goal of how we're going to get, fix, or help start to solve these problems. So my, I guess, uh, my, there's a word I'm searching for here. My, uh, I'm trying to get everybody here to do something. I, I saw a lot of hands here. All right, yeah, but my, my trying to get everybody to do something here, my <laughs> suggestion is let's set a goal for this university because most of us have a stake in this university where if we see a problem, we can fix it. So if we say we want a class based on this information mandatory for every first year students, then let's write that down, goddammit, and make sure that the administration of this makes that mandatory for every single person who graduates from this university to get that education because otherwise, the people in your class, they're going to leave this university thinking that, you know, the Latinos are going to come in and, and take over the country and blah, 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 and, and all this other stuff. I don't no, know. No, I'm not cor correct. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I saw a lot of hands actually from the panelists. Uh, Anne's first, and did I see oh, Mike, and then Steve. Well, I know, um, I, don't, I don't know about the rest, but I know Paul, myself, and Peter, we took our consciousness and brought it to the streets of New Haven, rerunning youth programming. 